Namaste, everybody. I am Vijinder Sharma, and I would be talking about my book, Essays on Indic History, today. You know, but before I begin, I would like to thank uh, Sangam Talks again for uh, giving me that uh, opportunity to interact uh, with you guys and, you know, uh, sharing that platform with you. I really hope that session is going to be uh, interesting for uh, everybody. Uh, I'm obviously very excited about this. When I started writing the book, a lot of people asked me why, uh, you know, Indic history and why not just uh, Indian history or ancient Indian history. Uh, it's a it's a valid question. Uh, my idea of writing the book was primarily to present the facts from a purely Indian perspective. Uh, what I what I mean by this is I wanted to understand and present uh, the Indian history from an insider's view. Much of what we uh, read today in academic work is uh, Indian history, which was understood and interpreted by Westerners. So I sort of wanted to bring my own perspective. I mean, I'm, I'm not a historian or not a expert on this, but you know, whatever uh, information I have and whatever perspectives I have, I wanted to bring out the Indian history in that light. So, you know, I, I, I hope that this sort of worked out for, for everybody. The readers who have uh, so far read the book, you know, when Westerners interpret history for us, there are biases which is uh, natural to come. One of the biases, uh, one of the uh, bias of their own history and culture. The second is the religious bias and third is the racial bias. We'll talk about it. Now, if you take the first bias about understanding history. Now, if you read ancient European history, uh, we come across the uh, Minoan and uh, Mycenaean civilizations, which were the Bronze Age, uh, Bronze Age civilization of Europe, which sort of came to an end around uh, second millennium BCE because of a Dorian invasion. So that was the popular belief back then that you know the idea of invasion wiping out a civilization was popular and got entrenched into the European archaeology circles, which you know which were doing the research back then. So when Mortimer Wheeler uh, was doing an, his excavation in, in India in Mohenjo-Daro, and he came across a, a site which had uh, skeletons, immediately said that, you know, this is because of an invasion and this is a site of a massacre. Now, there was the technology was not really good back then, so there was no mean to understand the reason why and how these people were killed, but he anyway drew that parallel because he had that bias of his own history uh, of, of Europe. So he sort of blamed uh, Indra uh, for that kind of a uh, massacre and uh, destruction of the civilization. And by that extension, he also blamed the Aryans for, for that. And that's how we have the Aryan invasion theory, which you know still is being uh, debated. And though it's discredited mostly, but uh, there are people, there's a section of people who still sort of uh, keep it burning, uh, make it an issue out of that. The other uh, bias uh, I spoke about is the religious bias. Now, most of the early historians or people who really went on to translate our religious texts like the Vedas were Christian priests and they obviously had their religious biases. So, uh, you know, when we see the translations, we find words like blasphemy in those texts and the, the Hindu culture, uh, the Hindu religion, the Indian system have no such word as, uh, you know, translate to blasphemy. So, but, 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 you know, once they are trying to do a translation and they really don't know what this Sanskrit word means, they try to find a closest synonym in their own uh, language, which of course is heavily influenced by their own religion. So, you know, that's the kind of bias we get in translations of our, uh, of, of our religious texts. Uh, another example I would like to share here is the prevalence of 33 crore Devi Devitas. You know, that's also the, the word koti, you know, in Sanskrit doesn't only mean uh, 10 million or a crore. It has many, many meanings. You know, uh, I, I did some research and found out that it can mean an extremity uh, limit an alternative, a category, a series, succession, etc. So there are so many synonyms to the word koti, but because of lack of understanding, 
the Koti got trans- translated as Karod. And, you know, they, we, we are still living with that and sort of becoming, you know, the, the view has been imposed on us. And even in 21st century, we doesn't, don't seem to shake it off. So, you know, that is the kind of bias we are dealing with. And the expert, the Western experts, when they understand and interpret history for us, Indians, our own history, you know, it sort of becomes white white explaining. You know, when a white man or a woman tries to uh, understand history, Indian history, and then tells us, you know, this is what it really means. So I think we have to understand uh, these biases and where they come from. Also, the third uh, bias I was talking about, the racial bias. You know, when the early attempts of understanding Indian history was being done, Mohit Jadado and Harappa were being excavated, that was also the time when the theory of uh, evolution by Darwin was gaining currency, you know, the survival of the fittest. So this sort of came into the everyday life of people, uh, the Europeans, and since they were able to conquer, colonize, and rule the Africans, the Asians. So it naturally meant for them that they are somehow fitter than the, the, the people who are being colonized. So when, you know, in, in early uh, history, when the Britishers came, we have instances where they would dress up like Indians and, you know, pick up a local language, start speaking that language. But all of that suddenly changed when this Darwin's theory uh, started gaining currency and this sort of, uh, you know, led to distortion of history in the subsequent years when they uh, started interpreting history because, you know, early on, Mohenjo Dado uh, and, and Harappa, the excavation, they were not even considered to be older than the Buddhist time. You know, 8th century, they, they found the records of Vayan and, and uh, the other Chinese travelers and they sort of said, no, this can't be older than this. Because they had this bias that, you know, something that old cannot exist. Uh, they cannot be built by people who are, you know, sort of being ruled by us. How can an inferior race uh, build or create something which is so fantastic? So that is the kind of, you know, biases, the racial bias that we, uh, that we come across uh, in our history, which has got entrenched over a period of time and becoming difficult. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy that there's now a lot of people who are trying to sort of overcome this. They are trying to come up with different ideas, with new facts, new ways of telling our history. But uh, I think, you know, such biases distort our history, uh, which, can, which can be clearly seen in the case of uh, Indian history. You know, as I already said, the discredited theories like Aryan invasion or the imaginary Aryan Dravidian divide, they still exist because a bunch of biased uh, Western historians uh, wrote distorted history to meet their own ends. Uh, they had their own agendas uh, during colonial times. It was suitable for them to create a narrative that, you know, uh, listen, you Indians, we are sort of superior people and we have come to rule over you. And this is a good thing. But, but you guys were not really that good. But now I'll just be happy because we are here. So uh, my attempt at writing this book was to be free from such biases. I wanted to present our history as seen by an Indian who has no racial or religion bias. I'm happy to share that my sentiments found resonance with hundreds of readers who read my book in the past two years. It was first published in 2020. You know, when I... It, uh, published self, uh, it was a self-published book and I was told that, uh, you know, it, in average sale of a self-published book is 250 copies over a lifetime, which usually doesn't last beyond two to three years. But um, I, I'm happy that that number, the average has been crossed over a few times. So it, it definitely tells me at least that a lot of people are there who want to read Indian history from an Indian point of view. If, if it is told uh, from an Indian point of view, there is an audience for that. And uh, I'm, I hope that there are a lot of other people who would take up this chance and, and do work in this. You know, over the past uh, decade, when I started reading uh, Indian history and ancient history, really fascinated me. And that's something which is very close to my heart. I realized that there was so much more our ancient history 
then you know it, it tells us that what we read in schools uh, the the problem i saw that there was so much of information available but all of that was scattered in bits and pieces uh, a research paper here says something very interesting then there is a footnote uh, in another book you know which is also an interesting fact but you know there is there's nothing at one place which uh, one can read and that's what inspired me or sort of you know uh, pushed me to write uh, this book and that's how though the book follows a chronology of events you know in a, in a, you know the period wise but the essays are written in a manner that they are independent of each other and they can be read in their own right and not depending on you know you don't have to read the first essay to understand the second so uh, that's how i have structured the book in the in the book and the chapters i really loved writing were on uh, the sindhu saraswati civilization i find that period absolutely fascinating the ancient indians did some fascinating uh, work uh, back then which not only impacted them but also had a great influence on uh, communities thousands of kilometers away uh, their contemporary civilizations in uh, west asia and in north africa you know almost a quarter of the book talks about the sindhu saraswati civilization and i think it deserves a much more space but since i want to include uh, other topics the 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 space was limited uh, for my work but I, I, but i'm i'm sure uh, somebody should uh, take up this challenge also to write the entire book on those interesting facts you know we have in school we have read about town planning and the sewage system of uh, the harappan cities but that's that's a good piece of information so 5000 years ago we had a good network of streets and there was a system of sewage but what does it really tells us yes so uh, you know in its own right that in piece of information is 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 a good piece of information but you know what do we understand from that or on the other hand there's also this concept of standardized rates and measures that uh, the harappan cities had but in its own right yeah it, it's a good piece of information but what do we understand by that what these weights and measures uh, you know standardized and uh, the sewage system for example who was making it who was building it maintaining it uh, you know all these questions when we ask we get certain answers and that sort of you know changes the entire perspective in which we see these things so it's one thing to have a short paragraph mentioning okay town planning check sewage system check standard weights and measures check but what is the context behind that so you know for example if we take town planning and sewage system one should ask who was paying for that because it needs resources to build maintain you know, who was ensuring the compliance that these the streets were you know constructed of a certain bit um, who you know these these kind of ordinary questions that should pop into our mind give us that extraordinary answer you know so uh, we we don't have any written records of uh, that time so we don't have any concrete information on on these questions but you know we know that it can't be done arbitrarily there there can't be people who build their own street in front of their house or their own plumbing system or with the sewage system sorry but you know to ensure smooth functioning of civic facilities of a city it is important there is an effective system of administration a system where tasks are allotted uh, and compliances are ensured through a system of hierarchy of governance like like what we do today like we have municipalities at city level something similar would must have been there in the ancient times for these things to work but you know the upkeep of streets uh, ensuring there were no encroachments etc so this all these things fall under the purview of an administration so we we should uh, you know uh, believe that there was a system of administration which was ensuring the compliances across so all these required also trained workforce so there was somebody who was training people to do that to do the maintenance work to do the construction work thus you know we can arrive at a conclusion that the people of the city would pay some kind of tax to an administration authority which would in turn provide the services so you know that because obviously the 
the government or the administration can't just generate resources they you know if they're providing a service they can't generate resources on their own but once we understand this that there must be some form of taxes may not be money but some for even in form of kind you know a barter system that the things we we used to have you know 5000 years ago there was a system in place which uh, made sure that people of the city got services and uh, probably they got paid by those people so this gives an entirely different perspective to the piece of information that there was a network of streets or uh, there was a network of uh, sewage system but you know that piece of information alone can't do any good and that's what i have tried to include in my book so i sort of ask questions and try and give plausible answers to them um and another thing we we spoke about weights and measures so you know uh, why people of uh, sindhu saraswati civilizations had standard weights and measures uh, why can't different cities have their own weights and measures because you know small cities local markets you can do whatever you want to do but this probably tells us that you no know, various cities of uh, these uh, of that time they, they traded with each other so you know both precious and non precious commodities would have been traded we have example of uh, lapis lazuli being traded across you know for precious metals like gold or non precious commodities like uh, fruits or you know, produce for example but these things you know if, now imagine if a city like harappa has the smallest unit of weight which is 100 grams and rakhigarhi on the other hand has the smallest weight which is 90 grams but so if a trader from one city goes to the other how are they supposed to barter because the weights are different so we we know that this tells us that the trade network amongst these cities was so strong and they were dependent on each other uh, so strongly that they actually have to standardize those weights so that they don't have to end up uh, you know at a at an exchange officer's desk to get the right price for that you know that something similar that used to happen with uh, money uh, gold or silver coins that they needed money exchanges because the weights were different but so you know to in you know, to put a system of standardization eliminates that need of uh, of of a person and makes trade easier so uh, you know i have in the book uh, i have also uh, devoted devoted an entire essay on the engineering feats of uh, sindhu saraswati civilization you know if we take the example of the great bath which is said to be a artificially created water body for ritualistic purposes now the we today have a lot of tools around our cities uh, it's nothing great but imagine 5000 years ago you have to create a pool where you have to ensure that the water is not leaking around to not going back into the ground because it's a place where people come uh, it's a public place they do their ritual so the water soaks into the ground it's no good so what do they do they you know they lay a layer of bricks finely fitted together put a layer of gypsum on top and then cover it with uh, bitumen you know that's the ultimate form of uh, waterproofing back then and you'd be surprised that you know even today uh, in 2022 when people construct their houses the roof is more or less uh, waterproofed in a similar manner today we use a layer of Of, of a plastic sheet, but uh, the bricks and and the bitumen layer is still there, and that's what makes uh, the houses waterproof. And uh, imagine that the pool was, of course, uh, waterproof, but the same technology would have been used to waterproof the houses. You know, that's how people can have uh, houses. Even there, there were multi-story houses, but you know, the, the technique was still the same. another very interesting part that i really uh, liked was the cascading system of reservoirs around the city of dholavira you uh, know dholavira is lies in an arid sort of semi arid arid part of uh, the indian subcontinent and water was scarce but there was a city and they had to survive it was a trading city so how do they uh, manage their water needs so they created a series of pools around the city the city wall which were of different Uh, depths and they had sort of a you know cascading flow of water 
so water the flood waters will come and enter into one uh, one reservoir uh, will get settled there the sedimentation would happen and then water would flow into the next pool and similarly you know by the time in in a couple of months when the monsoon is about to go uh, is recede the water is there in all the pools and the sedimentation has happened now this not only requires civil engineering you know which uh, the cascading waterfall someone has to think uh, the gradient of the of the land and how deep the pool should be how the access to the pool would be how water would flow you know th- these are all the things that uh, we we have to see that the people were doing 5000 years ago you know and also we we spoke about this western bias you know that in case of sindhu saraswati civilization this comes like you know the civilization collapsed but did it really collapse and why do they think that you know the, the civilization collapsed because in their history the, the minoans uh, and the mycenaeans did got got sort of wiped out or uh, the culture got wiped out by a invasion so you know th- that story of aryan invasion continues down and say okay since we don't find cultural evidence of similar town planning or or pottery uh, which means that the sindhu saraswati civilization actually collapsed but we have so much evidence that uh, points out the continuity from sindhu saraswati civilization to present day the continuity not only reflects in our religion but also in our everyday life so from kind of painted pottery we use today to the dyes we use to play uh, ludo and even the the sacred flora which includes a uh, people tree for example the motifs but they are all continuing even today after a period of 5000 years so where is the question of you know the civilization getting collapsed i'll tell you a, a story which you know is very relevant it's not too far away uh, we are going to observe navratri very soon you know there is a custom in north india especially parts of eastern india and western india also uh, people keep uh, a space in their house where they bring uh, soil and plant uh, barley seeds and they let it grow for 10 days and then uh, use it in on the day of dashera for, for the puja now what is the significance of this you know to to understand this we have to go back 5000 years in one of the cities on the banks of either sindhu or saraswati you know it's end of september or middle september the monsoon is almost receded from northern india the flood waters have dissipated the banks of the river are now covered in rich alluvium and this is the time you know when the sowing for ravi crop starts to be harvested in spring so the farmers would go and sow the seeds during that time and then uh, you know tend the fields wait for for the uh, harvest time this this activity in its own must have been you know so important for survival and obviously so because food is what keeps you going for another year this activity in in a way got importance in our lives and you know long after people stopped being farmers they became tradesmen they became you know chariot makers or whatever right? but but this activity still remained so close to their heart that they elevated it to a religious level and it continues to date i mean how many of us in i mean i live in delhi and how many of us in delhi are the farmers but every household has this ritual during navratri so you know we have so much continuity the evidence of it that it's not really you know no longer one can say that there was a collapse of uh, of the sindhu saraswati civilization but again we have to you know sort of counter that bias through evidence through data through research uh, and in a very small way that's what i have you know tried to uh, try to do another very uh, important thing that i talk about in the book is the contribution of the ancient indians into the world uh, knowledge repository system you know in the book i have dedicated seven essays to different knowledge systems that uh, india pioneered these include arts uh, medicine science astronomy language and mathematics uh, so if you if you see you know uh, 
a, a lot of things that the the then ancient world or or the even the medieval world practiced in terms of uh, science uh, and and medicine was was a flow from india to to west so so over a longer period of time this dissemination happened but you know in the uh, if i have to take an example i'll take the example of panchatantra now this panchatantra suppose today has become a, a story book for kids you know they, they are, there are cartoons there are story books but panchatantra is a niti shastra it's you know it's it was written to impart everyday every day to you know to deal with everyday situations where people have to use their judgments and how to use those that judgment and that's what the stories tell us and this got transmitted from the uh, from ancient india to west uh, during the middle ages after the uh, islamic invasion happened you know those texts were copied in arabic then they were uh, they went to europe and translated in almost all languages and much before that they went east incorporated into buddhism even japan you know i have mentioned in my book that uh, missionaries in japan started using panchatantra stories uh, and and started telling them that jesus is also an avatar of buddha so you know that is the sort of impact that panchatantra has had on on people similarly in mathematics you know the the fibonacci se- sequence that we talk about today was actually uh, discovered by pingala almost a thousand years before uh, fibonacci even came in contact with indian numerals you know he was living in algeria and that's where he met uh, met an arab merchant and who uh, handed over the indian uh, number system to him and he was so fascinated that he wrote an entire book uh, on indian uh, mathematics uh, similarly on medicine indian medicine uh, system formed the basis of almost all medieval uh, medications in in middle east and uh, in in europe you know the the charak samhita it's not only a text on uh, the diseases cure and symptoms but it also gives us code of conducts that doctors have to follow including instruction on not overcharging the patient and you know taking their consent before uh, before examining them especially women you know so that's on the kind of information i have tried to include in the book which in a normal history book i have hardly found but they were they, these information are available in in different parts and different in, in different journals and some research papers as i said so my idea was to uh, bring them together in in an in a form of essay where people can read it and uh, you know i can talk probably more on this and i would like if there are any questions uh, i would be happy to answer so you have uh, 34 essays in the book and uh, you have made this very interesting comparison of natya shastra and bollywood you know when you compare indian movies with with say hollywood movie you know they are totally different you know the uh, hollywood movie is shorter is is you know relies heavily on on visuals and uh, it also is you know removed from much of what we in india say entertainment like you know song and dance you know when i when i read about martha shastra it's you know the first thing that struck me was the uh, use of uh, you know preshak the word preshak which we see uh, you know and the english translation when you say you know, that the audience now there's a difference between uh, preshak and audience the audience is we you know we relate with audio hearing so you know that's the the, the art form the performing performing art there is more tuned towards hearing i'll preshak we see you know we we see darshak the, the, the hindi word that we use you know darshan is something related to your visual what you see so natya shastra makes it i know amply clear that you know you have to put up a spectacle it has to be a spectacle that is what people need so you know when we compare this to our bollywood films that is what we have today you know it good successful commercially successful cinema uh, movie is a spectacle so you take the recent uh, rrr or 
KGF or Bahubali, you know, these the successful movies, they were all spectacles. They were not meant to, you know, not only were meant for your ears, but was meant for your eyes so that you can see what's happening on the, on the stage or on the screen. Also, if you see our uh, other performing, uh, performing performance arts art forms like Nautanki or Jatra in, in Eastern India, they are all very, very heavy on visuals, uh, be it the, the dressing sense, the, the makeup, uh, the way they talk. It's all very, very what we sort of, you know, look down upon now as over the top. But that is what it is, you know, that's what engages the audience. You know, we might pretend to be very sophisticated and love, sort of loving minimalism, loving people, but deep inside, we are not that. Uh, we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are meant to enjoy things which are over the top. And that's what the cinema gives us. I wanted to ask uh, Vijayendra what his views are on what the home looked like in the Sindhu Saraswati civilization. So I have come across a lot of depictions, which I personally, it doesn't sit well with me, given the fact that pottery was so advanced and uh, uh, the people of the civilization made very colorful artifacts. So somehow the idea that every depiction of, or every reconstruction or every reimagining of uh, the Hindu Saraswati civilization shows a row of sand-colored houses, or you know, it looks like a desert. So I want to know, what do you think? Do you think that that's how they look, or they probably used to adorn their houses? They had colorful houses. Or um, you see, in Nirvan, yeah. there is no definite way to answer your question because there is no evidence as such that partly, or not partly, but mostly, it is to blame on the climate that we are in, the, the tropical climate with months of monsoon, humidity, preserving anything in this kind of a climate is very difficult. And that is that is why we probably don't have any uh, written records from that time. So uh, to answer your question, I think you know, from what I have read, from what I have researched, Many Sindhu Saraswati civilization houses were multi-story, at least two-story. They had they had cross ventilation, they had bathrooms within the houses. So they, you know, you I can't imagine that somebody with the kind of advanced technology from that time's point of view would uh, not decorate their houses. It's not possible. What probably, you know, if, if you see houses in rural India, even today, especially in Western India, Gujarat and, and Rajasthan, I would point out, uh, those even small villages, no, not villages, they're, they're the cluster houses, which are called dhanis. They have beautiful frescoes painted on their walls. And... I have no reason to believe that similar uh, decoration was not done in that time. We don't have any evidence because it's it just peels off. After one rain, everything goes and you have to recreate it uh, in the next season. Something would have or similar would have happened in those cities because uh, as we know, they, they, they didn't really disappear overnight. They were abandoned, uh, people moved. And uh, over a period of time, you know, the city became empty. The houses were still standing. They they got buried inside, so exposed to climate. You know, before that entire area was covered over. So all that decoration, whatever it was, got washed out. So there is no definite way to say what kind of frescoes were there. Uh, we can only imagine that you know, okay, just take, let's take a look at the pottery. You know, uh, so there are bison peacock drawn there, there are uh, antelopes, uh, or you take the seal and there are tigers, etc. So we can only imagine that something similar uh, was, was there. So, you know, to answer your questions, uh, question, I really don't have, or there is no real answer to, uh, a definitive answer to that, that what was the, you know, the facade of the house. Uh,
I had read your book, and in that book, I I think you wanted to steer clear of controversy when you ended the book just before the Islamic invasion. And no, actually, I am asking this because I recently got this book, and it's by Dilip Chakraborty of Cambridge. Uh, I hope everybody can see it. Uh, the name of the book is "Towards a Nationalist Narrative of India's Ancient Past," and like. Dilip Chakraborty has written actually a trilogy of uh, series on this, where que- uh, questioning the mainstream uh, Indian history writing, and I think this is the third uh, in that series. And I don't know if you have have the, had this have a, had a look at this book, and I think it touches upon the issues that you had raised previously, like uh, questions of race, questions of religion, and uh, um, methodology itself. And and he actually synchronizes it, and uh, this book is political. So, like, if you have read this, any comments on that? Yeah, you are definitely you are right. I the idea is not to shun controversy. The idea is to give the opportunity to the reader to think. You know, I don't want to, or I the idea was never to come up with a conclusion that okay, you know, it's I, it's not a mathematical formula that I'm. You know, writing or it's not basic maths where two plus two is four. Now, if I'm like you know, I Nirvan asked the question about the houses. So now there is no evidence or anything for me to say. You know, I can say that oh yes, the houses were painted and the fresco was there. You know, I don't want to make that conclusion. I want to give you what the research is available. I want to tell you what some people are saying. perhaps on the both sides and then i want to leave you with that information so that you know you if you want to uh, do some more research on that that would be great because that sort of serves the purpose of the book if you want to make your draw your own conclusion based on the information i have given or provided is also good my idea was never for the book to draw conclusions on anything i have done that At at a couple of uh, places, but that is because there is very strong evidence to suggest one thing or the other. But um, and I had I did not stop at Islamic invasion because I didn't want to uh, enter into controversy. I stopped there because that period of time is sort of you know it was a gener it was it was a uh, civilizational shift. that invasion you know brought india to a civilizational shift and i did not want to you know continue that uh, my present book into that that it requires a separate study altogether it has its own space that's primarily the reason i stopped there not because i didn't want controversy namaste vijayendra ji <laughs> thank you so much for the talk uh, my question was given india's history is so illustrious so vast and we explored knowledge in so many spheres of life when you decided to cover that expanse how did you decide which aspects to pick to write your essays on um very good question aditi ji it was not a easy task for me uh, it because you know while i was researching there was so much coming uh, coming up it was not possible for me to uh, you know pick everything and uh, you know like we pick our battles i pick my essays as i said you know i wanted to bring forth information which is not in the popular realm of history um, you know what we mean by or what i mean by popular realm is you know something that we read as students i don't know many people who read uh, history as as a hobby so you know those are the things that i wanted to touch upon and i also wanted to touch upon you know we we these these contributions of the of the ancient indians to the world the seven essays that i have picked up i really wanted to uh, touch upon those things because sindhu saraswati people know uh, alexander's invasion people know but you know we there, there is so much a uh, gap in that area as to you know we we all talk about our glorious past and uh, india was the golden sparrow and you know we we all talk about that but what made india that golden sparrow why was it the golden sparrow 
so these are the kind of you know things i wanted to bring forward and that went on top of the list so if in in one line if i had to answer it you know i picked up subjects which which are not in the popular realm of, uh, of history i just uh, just a thought hit me given the fact that there's a lot of uh, information we don't have about the sindhu saraswati civilization like you were saying there are a lot of things that we can surmise from what we have yeah. so very common thing that people say about the civilization is that there were there was no it's probably a civilization which did not have monarchy or did not have some kind of authoritarian regime so what are your views on that see it's not possible we as humans are bound by hierarchy we if if we are left alone to on our own devices there will be chaos and indians 5000 years ago were no exception just like today if you know you you leave uh you know not just people just imagine a teacher moving out of the class for half, for half an hour you know what happens in that classroom so it's it's very uh, naive to think that there was no hierarchy i don't know what kind of hierarchy was there but you know as we as we as i said for something as basic as providing a sewage system you need hierarchy so and we don't or why people say it was not hierarchical is because people have not found evidence now what do we mean by evidence so if we go to the mesopotamian civilization there they have found palaces or in the egyptian civilization they have found palaces which were you know by the scale of it or or the tombs or the pyramids uh, in in case of the egyptians they 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 sort of you know indicate that this is a hierarchical society there were palaces where a certain section of society lived and there were smaller houses where another section of society lived so there's a clear hierarchy and this must have been a palace or this must have been a king's tomb so it's very clear in those cases but in case of the sindhu saraswati civilization we don't have that kind of a evidence so that no palaces have been found now we can say that you know maybe the the leader let's call that person a leader not a king or a queen that leader did not live in a palatial home but does that mean that there was no hierarchy does that mean that there was no uh, administration i don't think so there was definitely some kind of administration people were allotted their their jobs and they were doing it and there was some kind of supervision we don't know what the extent of that was again because we don't have any uh, written records it was good to have some questions you know also gives me an opportunity to reflect what i have uh, written <laughs> so it was it was really uh, nice to to have those questions thank you everybody